All right, thank you, sir. Um, and just for the purpose, we are filming this one just so we can share it with some of your colleagues, just because I can't make all the days later uh, for that. If as long as you guys are okay, and if you want to feel free to move also, I'm going to take the mask off just so they can see my mouth move a little bit more. Um, and I'll stay a socially acceptable distance apart and I've had the vaccine if that helps. All right, cool. Now that we got the pleasantries taken care of in the pandemic. Awesome, thank you guys for having me. I am the STARS program dude, hey you. Uh, officially, I will also answer to Nick. Um, and uh, mostly what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about trach patients here today. But I wanted to give you guys a brief overview of STARS and what we're doing just so you have some cognizance uh, when you hear that name and what it means. Officially what we are, we are a health information exchange that shares information from the pediatric hospitals to EMS providers in the field regarding high risk, high acuity kids that they have living in their venues. All right, so we want you to know about your trach vent dependent kids that are in your district. We want you to know about your hemophiliacs, patients that you might have to uh, render different treatments that you're not used to, or that might not be part of your standing protocol. That sounded real bad. All right. Anyways, um, that might not be part of your uh, standing scope or protocols. We provide that information uh, in a form to you that I'll show you here briefly. And then that allows you to follow it. Every STARS form you see live and active on this planet had to be approved by a pediatric physician at our hospital. And then it had to be approved by your EMS medical director. So the pediatric doc said, yes, this is absolutely the care that this kid needs. And then your doc said, yes, my crews can give that care to that kid if they encounter them in the field. So it's almost like custom made protocols. It sounds extreme, it's usually not. It's things that make a lot of sense. It's a cardiac kid who normally only sat 75 to 85%, you don't gotta give them oxygen, even though you might have a protocol somewhere that says less than 90% give oxygen. Ketogenic diet, you might treat blood sugar different. And so all we're trying to do is provide that specialty information for those kids. Um, and so we'll follow them. I can go on and on about you know the details of how the program works, but this is really a lot of what it's about. It's about knowing and meeting these kids prior to their emergency, either by reading their form or hopefully meeting them in person. That's uh, something that we encourage a lot. It makes a huge difference to meet these kids in a non-emergency setting. Um, we all probably take PALS and other pediatric courses, and the first thing those courses want you to do, you're supposed to walk in the door, and what is the first thing you're supposed to know after laying eyes on your patient? Sick or not sick, right? You're supposed to like make this, oh, sick or not sick. And a lot of that's based on how is that patient presenting? Are they presenting normally or abnormally in their mental status? But a challenge we see in the special healthcare community is that people often don't know what that baseline is and they make assumptions that can get them in trouble sometimes. And I've seen this burn crews um, both ways. You know, I've had crews who walked into a living room that looked like an ICU. The kid was obtunded. They said, call the helicopters, get my drill, pull up my epi, it's time to go to town. And what if I could tell you that's just that kid's normal baseline each and every day, right? But I've, one hundred percent, and if they're involved, that's that's a huge component. Unfortunately, a lot of the emergencies we see are either when they're not home, they're not involved, or else they're so far overwhelmed that day that they're in over their heads. Um, I've also seen it burn crews in the opposite way, and it happened to two of the best medics I know in the business. I guarantee you if they would have gone to a school and seen a kid not acting correctly, they would have checked a blood sugar. But they went to a special health care needs home for a kid who normally has respiratory problems, and they're like, ah, oh, his breathing's not so bad today, so we'll just take him on up to the hospital. What they missed was a blood sugar of 17 due to some adrenal insufficiency. So it really, and that's, let's be honest, that's embarrassing after a 30 minute transport to show up with that, all right? So, um, so meeting these kids, understanding how they present to you normally, starting to problem solve issues you're gonna run into on that emergency call. Like, how in the world am I gonna move this 80 pound wheelchair out of this house? Or how am I gonna get this ventilator and all this stuff out? You start to troubleshoot those problems when you meet the kids. Uh, the forms no longer look quite like this. Uh, just to give you guys uh, a brief example. So all the forms are now actually housed in a centralized application that EMS has access to. It's just at starsprogram.org. And what you get in there, all the forms will look the same. This is one of your kiddos actually, and so he's star 848. We never reuse numbers. Every kid gets their number and that's theirs until they graduate the program, uh, move away from our coverage area or are deceased. So uh, Mr. Lincoln is 848. 
Um, you can see he's one of uh, kind of a, looks like he walked a preemie route um, and has BPD and uh, possibly maybe we got some sort of genetic syndrome in play. He's trach vent dependent. Um, and his big thing is going to be we have to troubleshoot and fix the trach if he's go having severe respiratory distress. And obviously we're about to do an entire course on that. So um, when you have access to stars, you have access to all stars. So that way if you have a kid from Joplin driving through on 44 and they stop and they have an emergency, you can pull up their form. If you have a kid from Cape Girardeau visiting grandma over here and he has an emergency, you will be able to look up his form. All right, we can go more into the application and how all that works later. So let's get to the fun part. All right, so as we were starting the STARS program, one of the first glaring red lights we got was trach patients. It is the patient population we have seen the most morbidity and mortality in with EMS involved in the call. And in, we were started to ask, you know, like, well, how come we don't know how to do this? And we, you know, so we did a simple survey and what we discovered is that 60% of paramedics reported never being formally trained on pediatric tracheostomies. And we were like, that's crazy. And then we all sat around looking around the coffee table and we were like, I was never formally trained. And the next person was like, I was never formally trained. And so when we looked it up, what it, was, it was never part of the required paramedic curriculum. Up until a few years ago, special healthcare needs was not even a part of the required curriculum. There was this fancy line that said, oh, and by the way, you should go take some more additional classwork in like hazmat and special pediatrics with special healthcare needs. All right, they have added it, but it's still not very clear what we have to know. And obviously those of us who have already gone through are already past the initial curriculum. So that's why we work so hard to add it to continuing ed. We redid this survey in 2019 in a mixed uh, national platform with physicians, nurses, and medics and got the same exact numbers. 59% reported no formal training on pediatric trachs. All right, so let's start with the scenario. So you guys are dispatched out here to the lovely National Avenue and St. Louis Street to a dark SUV. You have uh, an elderly female patient running around the car, losing her darn mind. And in the back seat, you see this kid sitting in a car seat. They are pale, blue, cyanotic. You're not sure if you see any chest movement whatsoever as the kid's sitting there in the car seat. How are you gonna start to react to this situation? Get them out of the car seat, please. Trick or not, any sick kid comes out of a car seat, right? Because what does every sick kid in a car seat do? Crump, close off their airway. They can't take big, deep breaths. Perfect, so you got them out of the car seat. All right, this kid's still not breathing for you. All right, how am I gonna check his trach? All right, so drop the chin all the way back. All right. What are some things I instantly want to know about this trach? Is it kinked as a clog? So I'm gonna look at it, I don't see any kinks. What's something else even more basic than that that I wanna know right off the bat? Is it still inserted? Is it still inserted? The number, or the first killer of trach patients. Their tracheostomy tube actually just comes out of the stoma. It seems crazy, but we have to put really soft silicone in them we can't have rigid plastic because that'll rub the trachea and then they'll get scar tissue and have all kinds of problems from that. So we have a really flexible silicone. The problem with that is picking this kid up, moving them, family rolling them in their bed, it's super easy for that to pop out of place and people will miss it because it's lost underneath the trach ties and it's lost especially winter time underneath the winter coat and underneath the sweatshirt and people miss it. So we actually have had a few unfortunate calls where EMS actually arrived at the ED trach patient in extremis and when the ED pulled the trach collar down, the trach was actually just sitting outside of the stoma. So first thing, make sure your trach is actually sitting in your stoma. Perfect. What are the next things I want to troubleshoot? So we, we've kind of upset it. What, uh, what else do I want to do to make sure? Perfect, can I get air through this? Is this a patent airway? I have 100% faith that if we show up to a multi-vehicle accident and you, know, the first, you show up and the first crew says, hi, we innovated this one, the other one's got a nosebleed, so we're gonna take them because we all have worked with those crews, right? And they slide you a patient who's innovated. 
every single one of you would know what to do with a patient who shows up in front of you with a trach tube right there, right? You're gonna bag it, you're gonna check for chest rise and fall because you wanna know that air is patently going in and out of that airway. Think of the trach very much like an ET tube. You just wanna make sure air is going in and out of it. All right, so you go to bag it and you got no compliance. Where are you gonna go with this? Cool, so let's try, we try suction. All right, uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna run back to your truck to grab suction? Look around the car, see if they've got theirs, all right? These people travel with their equipment. See if their suction's right there? All right, you can't pass your suction catheter. All right, what are we, am I gonna do next for this kiddo? What is this? Obstructed. This is the same as a foreign body airway obstruction. This is as bad as a grape in a trachea. There is no air going through this airway that's supposed to be going through this airway for this kiddo. What you gonna do on it? Yank it. This kid is suffocating. Pull this out, you wanna substitute it with a replacement trach. That's what the rest of the course is for. All right, good job. All right, so this is my buddy Nathaniel. He's one of the first trach patients we put in the program and to me he illustrates a lot of the really important things that we need to know about kids with trachs and the differences between them and adults with trachs. Who here has run an adult with a trach before? All right, that's a pretty common call. A peds, has anybody run a peds one with a trach? All right, so still a handful, gotcha. All right, that adult, what do you remember? What do you remember about that type of patient and that type of call? What are some of those details? mucus, sputum. I learned the phrase lung butter teaching one time on this, all right. Grossness, I often also hear nursing home, bed confined, immobile, all right. And a lot of this comes down to reasons why adult patients earn a trach, right? They are usually at the end of a disease process and the surgeons and the docs look at them and say like, listen buddy, like your airway is precarious. We can bridge you a little while longer if we put a trach in and hopefully keep you going for a while longer. And I certainly have some uh, pediatric patients that fit into that category, but I have a bunch of pediatric patients who have a trach for a different reason. They have a trach solely because they were born with a bad airway. They were born with a congenital airway defect. And the ultimate goal with that patient population is we just wanna grow them bigger and stronger. We give them the trach to bypass their problem for a while, but we're gonna, the ultimate goal is we want to get rid of the trach. Get them bigger, get them stronger, maybe do some surgeries to resect whatever problem that we have. And then in the long term, we want to be able to take them off the vent. We want to be able to come along and start capping that trach. If you can live with the cap trach, turns out you probably don't need a trach. We'll see if we can't pull it. And if the patient's defined after that, plastics will come in, patch the stoma, and we will release that kid into the wild as long as we as the healthcare community can get them through that precarious few years where they have the trach. So that's the ultimate goal. So when you see my buddy Nathaniel out there, you're gonna go visit him in his house and you're gonna find a kid running, jumping, sliding down slides, playing on swings, uh, playing with Legos and fire trucks. And the ultimate goal, and then he's gonna turn around and look at you and he's gonna have a trach dangling out from underneath his chin. And you're gonna be like, whoa, what in the world? What's up with you, normal looking kid? All right, and that is because Nathaniel was just born with a high grade three subglottic stenosis. This is a fancy way of saying he was born prematurely. His trachea had not finished fully forming underneath his vocal cords. And his, vo his trachea was about the width of the end of a big pen when he was born, which was just big enough for them to have him born at Barnes, transferred one block north to Children's, and trached within the first day of life. So a trach is all he has ever known as an airway. Some other problems that you can be born with uh, so laryngomalacia, which uh, as you can see is a bunch of extra tissue on the outside of the vocal cords. And for my innovators in the room, like we always look at that picture and we're like, oh man, that's a lot of extra stuff to be in my way. I'm not even sure there's vocal cords underneath there. If you also think about that kid's longer term clinical course, that is a lot of extra tissue that can swell up and get swollen every time they have an upper respiratory infection or get irritated. That is also a lot of extra tissue that can hold droplets and secretions full of virus, bacteria, fungi, all those things that would love to drip down into your lungs and give you a nice infection. 
Absolutely. So that is uh, one that they work on being able to do a surgical resection if they can. Um, this problem is called tracheomalacia. Instead of extra tissue, think of it as a softening of the tissue. All right. And so what these kids, these kids just never formed good stout cartilage rings like you or I did. All right. And so this kid can quite literally just drop their head and kink off their airway like a hose. All right, and so what we do, well, we gotta bypass that problem. But the ultimate goal is to get that kid bigger and stronger, and some of those kids actually never even need like a surgical correction. If we can just help them grow and develop, a lot of times, you know, if they were preemies especially, they just need some extra time to finish developing, and hopefully we'll get them past that at some point. Um, some times, tracheomalacia can be so bad that it extends down into the bronchioles, and that's called tracheobronchiomalacia. Um, some of these kids, one of the impressive things is when they get upset or when they cry, it's actually so weak that they can compress it inwards. Like if they take like that really negative pressure breath, like in the middle of crying or screaming, they can actually collapse their airways by like up to 40% or something like that. It's really significant. All right. So at its simplest, what is a trach? Artificial airway. Perfect. Artificial airway put into a patient to bypass upper airway structures uh, for the purposes of ventilating your patient, right? And the only other fancy caveat put in by a surgeon, right? Like, well, no, we don't put those in. <laughs> so, all right. And if, like we already mentioned back at the beginning, think of it very much like an ET tube. Same thing. I have a set of problems. My patient uh, cannot, you know, well, let's, uh, let's ask this question. Why do patients earn ET tubes? What are the two categories of patients that are in an ET tube? Can't control or protect their own airway. What's number two? Failure to oxygenate or ventilate, which is really a fancy way of saying we need to breathe for them on their lungs on a ventilator, and to do that, we have to put a tube in long term, right? So if you think about that, okay, so those are my patients. You're in the field. I need to tube this patient because of this. What happens to that patient? That patient goes to the ED. The ED says, well, they're tubes, so we get to send them to the ICU as fast as possible. They go to the ICU. And then the ICU, they're there for a couple weeks. And ultimately, we hit a fork in the road. Ideally, what we want to be able to do is wean them down off the oxygen, extubate them, and not have them be a tubed patient. But some patients can't stand that. And so they're there, and eventually we're like, well, we can't leave you intubated forever. We, that's, and that's when you start to have that trach conversation. So the, you know, think of it very much, your trach is just your long-term patient that either couldn't protect their airway or needed oxygenation or ventilatory support. And so that's why you can think of it a lot like an ET tube. It's just a tube that bypasses a problem so that we can get air from here to here and back again. All right. Um, you will run into two types of pediatric trachs. There's many different brands, but the two main types, you are either going to have cuffed or uncuffed, all right? And you will always know you are dealing with a cuffed trach if you see this pilot balloon hanging out down here. I'll pass these around so you guys can look at them. All right. So that cuff will sit right down there and it will occlude. What are some reasons you could think of? Like, why would a patient need a cuff versus an uncuffed one? I'm sorry? Uh, no, but I like where you're going there. So, uh, which brings us to another great point. What holds a trach in place? The trach ties, absolutely. So just like the ET tube, you know, we don't secure it with the bulb, or at least I hope we don't have too many medics out here who are like inflating the bulb and being like, well, that's secure. I'm going to go do the next thing, right? No, no. Like you got to put the commercial holder on and same thing with the trach kids. It's the trach ties that hold it. The bulb is just like an ET bulb though we're occluding it. So if they have lots of secretions or aspiration coming down, we can prevent that from getting to the lungs a little bit. And then especially your kids where we are really having to put them on the ventilator and really control their pressures, their flows, their volumes. Um, and we can't stand that air leak coming up around the edge that you have to just close it off and make a closed system in the lungs basically. All right. So for those of you who'd run an adult call, you probably have seen this before. This is called a Shiley trach. All right. And the Shiley trach has one purpose in life. So we had already talked about the two major killers in my trach patients. We talked about it in the scenario. What was number one? Uh, obstruction, I would always say number two. I mean, th there's two of them. So obstruction's one of them. And more specifically, what is an obstruction in a trach? 
mucus. It's almost always mucus. Not to say you couldn't have a blood clot, but the vast majority of them are going to be mucus plugs. So, and then of course the decannulation or the dislodgement is the other one. All right, so let's talk about mucus plugs. Where does a mucus plug come from? The lungs, absolutely. So my trach patients, you know, they get sicker like you or me and they produce sputum and mucus that they're trying to clear up out of their lungs. You and I, we cough it out, we snot it out, we blow it out. My trach patient is bringing up that same mucus and sputum, but as it reaches their airway, it hits a new problem. There's a trach tube right there and it will start to get lodged in the bottom of the trach tube. On top of that, my trach patients have another problem that you and I will never have. So last week we had another amazing Missouri winter week, right? And you and I would walk outside on a five degree day and we would take a deep breath in and we would immediately start to warm and moisten that five degree air in our nasal passages and our oral mucosa, right? So five degree air might be 60 degree air by the time it hits my lungs. My trach patient is pulling ice cold dry air from directly outside their neck down their shortened trachea that we shortened for them and directly to their lungs where it is hitting that mucus and that sputum coming up the other way and it will dry it out. What is the, what is the layman's term for dried out mucus? A booger. That's all a mucus plug is, is that mucus is in the end of the, the, end of the trach, it dries out, it hardens, it plugs, it is a booger that is killing that kid. All right, and so, we have known these two to be the two major killers of our trach patients since the beginning of time. And so the adults have this nice one called a Shiley. The idea being you have a permanent outer lumen in the neck, but you have this internal cannula. You can twist it 90 degrees, you pull it out, you can wash it off, usually in the sink, and then you put it right back in your patient. And hopefully we washed off any of that mucus before it could build up and get bad. Unfortunately, we can't do that for the pediatric patients surely because of size. When you see those trachs coming around, there is just no room in that system. There's numbers on the front of every trach. This one is a 2.5. That directly correlates to the diameter of your ET tube on your truck, the same as a 2.5 tube. There is no room for a second tube system. And so that's why the kids have these. And the most, maybe the most important thing to get out of that is when we have to replace or clean a pediatric trach, the whole thing comes out and gets swapped out with another one. One of the first big myths we had to overcome was we had some EMS crews run these calls and they would say, hey, like a surgeon put that device in that body. I'm not taking that back out of that kid. And I can see how you could get to that logic, but it's so important for you to know that if you call that surgeon right then and there, he's gonna say, pull that darn tube out of that kid and put a clean one in. All right, that's what families do at least once a week, sometimes twice a week at home. This is how the family takes care of it as well. All right, so just know that that's standard of care for those to come out. Like any great device, it comes with a few accessories. Um, and probably all of you, I would imagine, have seen this one at some point. This is called an HME or a heat moisture exchanger. And what it's meant to do is to try and help to defeat the cold dry air problem. It sits on the outside of the trach and it captures the last little bit of exhaled breath in the chamber that the patient had. Then when they initiate the next breath, there's a buffer of warm, moist air that's sitting there before it reaches the lungs. It also has some little filters on the side just to catch any massive particulate that would, would, you might make it down the stoma. Um, it, some of the kids will refer to this as their nose and it acts like a nose and it gets gross like a nose. So Mr. Nathaniel, when he used to be sick with respiratory infections, he would go through 10 plus of these a day. Just family, you get, they get gross, take them off, throw them away, put a fresh clean one on. All right, this middle device is a super cool device. I believe it's on the end of one of the ones going around. Oh no, I popped it off. So this is a passy mirror valve. Um, and this is, it's actually got a great backstory. Uh, the guy who developed it actually ended up becoming a quad and wanted to uh, regain the ability to speak. And so some of your patients you will hear call this a speaking valve. It returns their ability to pass air over their vocal cords. Super simple, super easy, super cool. They take a breath in, it goes through the valve to their lungs, but when they go to exhale, that one-way air valve slams shut and they are forced to exhale normally up around their trachea. All right, so let's put this together. So they pull air in, but air can't go back out because the valve closes. So they pass air up around the edge of the trachea or around the edge of the trach tube and out their nose, out their mouth. All right. This last picture is just to show you a passy mirror valve in line in a ventilator. So just because your patient's on a ventilator does not mean that there might not be a passy mirror valve there um, present. These top three are not necessarily benign devices. 
So if you show up on a trach patient who is in distress and is in an emergency, get the extra superfluous accessories out of your way because not only are they not helping you, but they might actually be making your job harder. This one is just if it's clogged with snot, if it's clogged with mucus, if there's not good airflow through it, that's not really gonna help you. These can be a little bit more insidious, all right? So can you have a passy mirror valve in line with a cupped trach with a cuff inflated? No, and why not? The air can't come back around it. There's no way for the air to get out. Perfect. All right. Sorry, I keep going back to my diagram. So you get the air in, the valve closes shut so they can't exhale, but if you have a cuff inflated right there, there is nowhere for the air to go. It is an instant respiratory emergency. Unfortunately, this happens sometimes with home health nursing because they get their algorithms mixed up. They're trying to put this kid through passy mirror valve trials, but then they're also taught in an emergency if the kid gets in distress, put them back on the ventilator and inflate the cuff. And if they don't get the passy mirror valve out of the way, you're gonna hit an instant emergency that way. All right. Um, the passy mirror valve also accomplishes, sorry, I'm gonna skip back at one thing I skipped over. It does accomplish just a couple things for you. Um, so obviously the ability to speak is huge. Even for my real little kids, the ability to vocalize and verbalize, it turns out that hearing your own voice is a super important part of human growth and development in your brain. So we want to return them the ability to make noise and to, to make sounds. On top of that, we want to retrain their lungs to breathe more normally. Um, so if you think about my buddy Nathaniel, he has never had to deal with the expiratory force it takes to get air all the way out through your mouth and nose. He's only had to hear to hear, hear to hear, right? The other things he hasn't had to deal with is the epiglottis slamming shut at the end of your breath and keeping some peep in your lungs. He's just never had to deal with that. And so um, we start to use what are called passy mirror valve trials. And so they'll start 15 minutes, 30 minutes, one hour, just to see if the kid will tolerate it and their ability to strengthen their lungs and breathe more on a slightly more normal pattern like you or I. All right. So this is trach ties, it's super simple. We already talked about that's what holds the trach in. I do include it as an accessory because it's got a couple of important talking points. Unfortunately, this is a device that has hit the Etsy market. I know it's mind blowing, but it turns out some parents do not consider the medical blue to be that cool of a look. And so they have tried dog collars and necklaces and different various things to hold the trach in place to be maybe a little more stylish. It's a terrible practice and I try to tell them it's a bad idea every time I see it. And the reason why is it's not fair to you. All right, you're expected to show up on this kid on the worst day in the world and they're gonna have some strange device around their neck. I don't know about you, but I can't operate a gold clasp on the best of days, much less when a kid's crumping right in front of me. So I tell the parents, first of all, like that's not fair. You want to have everybody around your kid just know that everybody knows how to use Velcro. Um, so you know, let's go, I hate to say everybody, 99% of people know how to use Velcro, right? Um, and so um, switch to that. The other thing is I also warn the parents, I have a very low threshold before I start cutting things to get them out of my way in the middle of an emergency. So that collar might not last very long anyways. The takeaway I think most importantly for you is if you run on a trach patient, first of all, you're gonna do all the other things we're talking about to make sure the trach's good. But before you transport, maybe just take a look and see what's actually holding that trach in place. And if you encounter something weird, just like, hey, mom, dad, like, can we switch out for something a little more normal in case something happens on the way and I know how to operate it and use it. All right, we did mention suctioning, which is a very standard thing you're gonna to do to your trach patients. Always remember the first time you suction them, you're not actually worried about sucking anything out. The first time you run a suction catheter down through, what you actually wanna to prove to yourself is just that you can actually pass the suction catheter through so that you know you have a patent trait tube, all right? So if you go, when you go to suction them, please remember to drop the suction power from the standard 300 millimeters of mercury we use on our adults. We wanna be down closer to 100 for the kiddos, so 80 to 120. And you don't wanna go too deep. And sometimes that's a little counter to how some of us were taught along the way, right? Like, how were you guys taught to do deep suctioning? Like in the back of the truck for real, not in the textbook. Bury it. Bury it, I'm sorry, what was that? Yeah. Like, I don't know about you, I was told like, ram that thing down in there like you're uh, ramming a cannon until they start coughing and that's how you know you're in the right place and then you suction back out and that's how you know you did it right. Well, it turns out that's not really good long-term practice, all right? And so let's, and I think I can paint a scenario for you about why you wouldn't want to do that. So you got dispatched to a trach kid who's in distress. They are probably already hypoxic, 
84%, 88%, something like that. And they are tachypnic, they're struggling, and so now we're gonna suction them, and maybe appropriately so, but we're gonna suction them, and we are sucking oxygen directly out of their lungs, which in no way is gonna improve their oxygenation whatsoever. Then, when we really ram and slam that suction catheter down there, we're hitting the carina, right? The bifurcation of the lungs, which is a very sensitive spot because evolution or design, depending on which one you wanna go with, says we should cough so things don't make it into our lungs. So you're hitting that carina, they start coughing, all right, and they are now no longer breathing. They're coughing instead, which isn't gonna improve their oxygenation whatsoever. And the final component of that is that when you hit the carina, it causes a vagal response. So now you took a sick kid in respiratory distress, we're stealing oxygen from them, we're preventing them from breathing, and we're dropping their heart rate. And that's a really bad algorithm that we have to do lots of work at the end of, right? So instead what you wanna do is just clear past the end of the trach. Now if you, the first time you suction a kid, if you're in the middle of an emergency and you tap the carina one's like, I'm not, I'm not gonna come down and yell at you or anything like that. But what I really want you to think of the long term, you don't wanna keep doing that. So say you got, especially you got that transfer, either a 30 minute to the ED, or you're taking a kid from Springfield up to St. Louis to one of the hospitals uh, for three hours, you don't, every 15 minutes, you don't wanna be sitting there tapping that carina, right? Um, especially because it will de start to desensitize the carina over time and lessen their cough reflex. All right. Twirl the suction catheter on your way out, no more than five to 10 seconds. Give them some rest and some oxygenation in between. Don't just do back-to-back -back suctionings endlessly. Um, and you can use normal saline to loosen the secretion. So if you're getting real thick secretions that you're having a hard time sucking out, um, you can use one to three C's normal saline. Families will actually carry uh, saline bullets, which they just look like albuterol, they're pink, all it is is normal saline in there. You tear the top off, you spritz it down into the tube, maybe bag a time or two and then suck it back out. All right. Please, please, please grab the go bag. Every pediatric trach patient that goes home goes home with their emergency supplies, all right? Family that, unfortunately, the bags vary depending on which institution they came from or the family sometimes substitutes for their own setups. Um, but the equipment should be the same. They carry a an extra tube in the same size that's already in their neck. They also carry an emergency size smaller. So if there's like lots of swelling or you're having a lot of trouble passing that bag bigger tube, there's an emergency size smaller that you can grab that you can pass through there. Uh, they will come with suction catheters to their size. If they're on PEEP settings, there will be a BVM set to their PEEP settings already in that bag ready to go. Um, and so uh, the nice part is that like everything you need is right there. I mean, if you're one of those medics who loves to tear apart the pediatric bag and make your EMT partner clean it up later, first of all, you're a bad person. And secondly, you know, why destroy the back of your truck when every pro appropriately sized piece of equipment you need is right there in a bag ready to go with that patient, all right? So um, everything you, to help, especially the surgery packets as we'll talk about shortly. All right, so our rules for EMS on these trach calls. The trach is the problem until proven otherwise. This is a fancy way of saying everything else we say in EMS. Airway, airway, airway. Until you have proven that you have a patent airway, you cannot blow past this and go on to the other things. And like I said, it works just like or very similar to an ET tube, so you can use your dope mnemonic to troubleshoot it. So what's, and we were already doing this, right? So what's the D in dope? Dislodge. Dislodge displacement, that's the first thing. Every trach patient I come up on, hey, all right, trach tube's in the stoma, we're good. What's my O? Obstruction, that's where we're okay. If they got good vital signs, I might take the time to run a suction catheter down through to make sure it's good. If I have a patient who's an extremist and looks like they might be peri rest in front of me, I might just pick up a BVM and breathe for them. If you ever go to breathe and there's no compliance to your bag, that's almost proof positive that there's a mucus plug under there. And that makes sense, right? Because if you think about what bagging against a mucus plug is, it's bagging against a brick wall. You'll have no compliance. If you have a pop-off valve, all the air will be coming out through your pop-off valve. All right. Cool. What about P and dope? Pneumo. Pneumothorax. This always seems like an incredibly cruel part of the lecture where I'm like, hey, high-risk pediatric airways, and then they can have pneumos, right? Where I want you to remember pneumos is any time a kid has been resuscitated prior to arrival, and trach patients have a high probability of that, right? is I always wanted you to make sure you go check for lung sounds. I had a little girl get dis discharged home uh, last year. She had a tidal volume of 49 cc's. 
All right, any idea how much air is in one of your infant BVMs or your peed BVMs? Infants are usually 200 to 250, peds are usually four to 500. So she, this is an infant bag, she literally got a fourth to a fifth of this bag. All right, it takes nothing for somebody, a first responder, a police officer, a family member running on adrenaline to, I'm saving you, kid. This is me saving you. No, you're just grossly over inflating their lungs is what you're doing. All right, so just make sure that if somebody's done chest compressions or somebody has bagged a kid prior to your arrival that you make sure you get those lung sounds in. And that's really trach or no trach, any pediatric patient. All right, and what's the E stand for? Equipment failure. All right, so you walk in and the vent's throwing all kinds of alarms. Um, what are you gonna do about that? Take them off the, take them off the vent. If you're, a, if you're a ventilator guru, you, I mean, you can take your 30 seconds to try and troubleshoot the vent, but even then, most vent gurus I know, like just pick up a bag and start bagging them while they figure out what's going wrong with the calculator, right? So, um, so yeah, just troubleshoot your way through on those. And then almost NRP style, just whenever you have a high-risk kid every 30 seconds, asking yourself, is this kid getting better? Is this kid getting worse? Are they staying the same? Do we need to alter my interventions? Um, please bring the trach bag and the suction, all right? This is everything we're talking about. This is how you go through it. You get the kid, first things first, check patency or check placement, then check your patency. Make sure the patient's either moving air through it or we can move air through it, suction as needed. Um, and then assist them with ventilations as needed. If there is any doubt in your mind, if that kid is base or vital signs are coming back to baseline, strongly consider the trach change. If there's any doubt in your mind, just change it out. And I see this, I, I saw this recently, not to, to pick on this crew. They were awesome. They were very open to the coaching. And you could see they did everything but the trach change. They show up and it's a trach kid and they are t tachycardic and they're satin low and they're like, oh, we gave them some oxygen and they got just a little bit better. So we're like, okay, we'll suction them. And they got just a little bit better. And then they're like, vital signs were still the same. So we just drove five minutes real quick to you guys. Like, that's great, but you know, what you had to do, what you were supposed to do is if they don't, aren't getting any better, you need to do the trach change. And sure enough, they pulled that trach in the ED and it had the longest loogie you've ever seen in your life just sitting there hanging off the end of it. It was just a partial obstruction and that was preventing that kid from getting full oxygenation and ventilation. So, all right, if there's any doubt in your mind, just know that that's also just standard of care. Like if that family were to call with your report to Palm and say, look, he's, he's sick, he coughed funny, he's got some strange vital signs, Palm's gonna be like, hey, did you guys change out the trach? Just go ahead and change out the trach and then bring him in, right? So just know that that is a very standard thing that that happens. This is a statement that came from up on high, I believe it's from the AAP. If the tracheostomy tube needs to be changed out, allow the most experienced caregiver on the scene to do it. And I have not had a single class protest this statement. The only question is, who's the most experienced caregiver on scene? Parents. If the family's there, 100% you are supporting them. We get a couple of important learning lessons out of this one. So um, first of all, a lot of our major emergencies occur when the my, my primary caregiver is not present. All right, they're gone to work, they're gone to a funeral, they're gone to, out for the evening, something like that. The kid is with grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, something like that. All right, the other takeaway we get, um, first time home parents sometimes lose their minds. I see that sometimes. Um, you know, they are human like you or me. They, their heart rate hits 150, their cognitive brain separates from their animal brain. They no longer have a call button that brings seven people into the room right away and they panic, they forget what to do. Um, we have two cases of this. Um, uh, one's a good story, one's not a good story, and so we'll start with the bad one. EMS showed up, uh, mom was losing her mind. She was just throwing things around the living room. She wasn't really answering their questions well, and they called law enforcement and had law enforcement restrain mom. And unfortunately, as they did that, mom recalled, she said, hey, wait, you guys gotta change the trach, change the trach. And they said, a surgeon put that in that kid. We're not gonna do that, we're gonna let the ED do that. 15 minute transport, the kid suffered a significant anoxic brain injury. It was a very bad outcome on that call. All right, the second call, we had a medic show up and he didn't know a darn thing about trachs. He showed up to a living room with mom losing her mind and he said, mom, you're the expert here. Help me help you. How are we gonna get through this call together? How are we gonna help your kid? And she snapped back and she said, 
we're supposed to do the trach change. She got the bag, they knelt down side by side, he was her helping hands, they got the trach in. The kid ended up being transported just for some aspiration risks, but was discharged home four hours later with no negative consequences. All right, so if you can recruit them, even if it's a family member losing their mind, if you can recruit them back, that is a valuable resource on your scene, all right? I'll never tell you you have to transport a crazy person up front. But if you can calm them down, if you can bring them back, that is one of your best resources on scene, all right? This is a real life trach plug from a call. That was from a 911 save, so. All right, we're gonna watch a brief video just so you guys can see an actual real life change on a kid. Uh, for full disclosure, this did come from Cincinnati Children's. You don't have to tell my bosses that if you don't want to. All right, a couple important talking points that always come out of that video. Um, so first of all, it is sterile water that holds the cups open. It's not air. So um, if you, whenever you attach that syringe and you pull back, when you get liquid, you are doing everything right that day. You're not doing anything wrong. Um, the hyperextension, whenever you go to do the change, it is okay to let their head fall all the way back. This isn't like sniffing position in pals um, where we're just worried about like some sort of optimal angle to get air in and out. The whole point of this is you want your workspace to be as big as possible for you to do the trach change. So uh, whether somebody holds under their shoulders or you put a big towel roll, let their head fall all the way back, especially when you're dealing with like the little preemies with like no neck anyways, right? So they're, uh, they already have their chins resting on their chest. You need to pull them way back so you can see the stoma site clearly. Um, the other thing, if you're having trouble passing, so they teach the suction catheter. You, once you're there, you're sort of in a realm where like one out of every two pulmonologist agrees. What we actually suggest and use um, is what you're really worried about at that point really is that your obturator is getting hung up somewhere in there that you're having trouble passing it. And so if you can get it introduced and then almost thread it just like an IV, see if you can just thread the soft part without the obturator getting hung up on something and see if that'll help you pass. Um, lube is always your friend in any trach change. Uh, Nathaniel's mom, there are a couple times they had public emergencies. The worst ones were always when she said she didn't have the surgical lube packet with her because it was so difficult to get it to pass especially when the kids are going down like that, they're screaming and crying, right? So they flex up all the musculature in their neck and sometimes it can be hard to pass those muscles if they're all tensed up. And so just top off a surge of lube packet, dip your trach in, and then you're gonna introduce an advance. All right. Um, some other common complication questions I often get asked about. A lot of people are always worried about false tract. The idea of, can I, put that trach somewhere other than the trachea, like I don't want to put it in their esophagus or their sub-Q tissue. Uh, just know that's incredibly unlikely in the field. That's something we worry about in the hospital after we initially do the surgery, and the trachs are actually sutured in after the initial surgery while the kid's in the ICU, but then they have to be able to um, be completely healed to go home. Before they can get discharged home, they have a healed stoma site. Um, so that's really a, a pretty unlikely scenario. The trick to not ending up in the esophagus, of course, is just don't put massive amounts of downward pressure going back. You want to introduce and then follow the curvature of the trach around in as you hook into the trachea. All right. Um, difficult stoma and or complicated anatomy. I can almost teach a whole course on this. You know, we had one little girl who had a huge benign mass in her neck that they literally had one family member had to displace so that the family could do it. You're going to be reliant on talking to your healthcare or your, I'm sorry, your primary caregivers at that point. Like, hey, how do you guys navigate this? How do you do this? Um, I do have a lot of faith in EMS's ability to MacGyver as well. Like, yeah, I mean, you, you got to get the trach in. You've got to get an airway in. Um, and so however you have to manipulate that child to get them an airway. Um, no supplies is the last uh, concern I run into a lot, and, and it's bona fide. I mean, if either family didn't have the supplies with them or you guys started transporting and realized you forgot to bring them from the house, um, you know, what do you do if you have to replace the trach? First and foremost, you might be able to reuse the trach that they have. If all this was was a simple decannulation emergency, if you look at it and there's no plug and this seems like an okay trach tube, you might be able to just reintroduce it right back into the stoma. If you have trouble passing, you might grab an obturator just to help you do it. Um, but you might be able to just reuse that trach that's right there. Even if you pull one out with a mucus plug. So kid was in complete distress. I pulled the bad trach. I don't have a replacement trach. I could try clearing this one out. 
See if you can't uh, blast it out. If you had the obturator is ideal, but you might not have an obturator, grab a pediatric stylet, run that down there, see if you can't dislodge it. You can use a normal saline blast, see if you can't knock it out that way. But if you can clear this, if you, know, you look at it and you're like, okay, that's clear now, and you don't have another airway, I would just reuse the trach that I do have right there with me. I mean, if it hits the ground, maybe wash off any obvious dirt, but in all honesty, like this is an airway emergency, we need to get it fixed right away and we can give them broad spectrum antibiotics after they get to the hospital, all right? Um, and then uh, the last ditch thing we do still teach is if you're at a place where you're working um, where you still have uh, pediatric ET tubes, if you can't get a trach in by any other means, grab the appropriate size ET tube. The quickest way to know that is grab that number off the front. So this is a 2.5. Um, I think those were like 3.5s and 4s that I was passing around. This is a 4.5. Grab the correlating ET tube just introduce it into the front of the trachea and hold that in place and bag that. It's not the world's best solution, but it's better than that kid crumping with no airway until you can get them to an ED and get this fixed. Um, really important to grab the supplies if you can. Especially a lot of, I mean, most EDs you transport to in this world are not gonna have pediatric trach tubes, right? This kid travels with their backup equipment that everybody needs to be able to treat them. So really important, it's worth taking that couple extra minutes on scene if you got it to, hey, somebody go in and find that equipment. That equipment has to go with us. It goes with this kid, all right? Cool. All right, so that is what I know about all this. This is our, our motto, each kid counts. Um, and so um, always glad to educate. Please let me know if you guys have any questions, concerns. Um, I hate to derail it any bit. Just know that there are a couple of really strange types of trachs in this world. These are by far the most common, um, but every now and then you'll run into something different. Just know that you, those are different than these um, and that you will need to consult the caregiver. If we, you have a kid in your area that has one of those, we send all the information with it. We say like, hey, this kid has got this one in a million trach tube and this is what you gotta know about it and what you gotta do about it. So I hate to get too far into those because they're kinda, they teach a little bit different than these. Yes, yeah, so trach vent is an automatic trach. I mean, I won't tell you, so if you have an older kid, say a teenager or something like that, obviously our program's only been around five years, so if like nobody ever referred to them, uh, there's some older kids that we don't know about, but any trach going out of Glennon or Children's gets put into the program now. So I didn't tell you the, the one last one, especially on the trach ties, sometimes what you'll encounter is extra Velcro and extra tape. Um, and so uh, that's because some of my kids have figured out this really fun game that if they pull that trach out, all these alarms start going off and every adult within 50 yards comes running as quickly as possible. And it's a fun game as long as the adults get there. Um, and so yeah, you'll see like parents have put like extra straps of Velcro or extra rounds of tape on there um, because they're dealing with a kid who's being a kid, right? So yeah, and you're right, it's, there's lots of extra training programs. I would say one of the biggest challenges we see um, is home health nursing. Um, as we send kids home, that's kind of a prerequisite for a lot of these kids to be able to go home, these complex medical kids that are coming out of our hospitals. Um, and they have to get nursing lined up to help the parents. But a lot of times that kind of evaporates over time. Um, it's not a requirement that home health nursing is specifically trained in ventilators, G-tubes. We've had stories of home health arriving the home and being like, the parents will be like, okay, here they are. And they'll be like, what is all that stuff? like? I'm just here to like change a diaper and like maybe put a feeding in a G-tube. Like, no, this is a vent. They'll turn around, they'll, well, I'm leaving. So it's very uh, kind of a indicative of the crisis a little bit in home health nursing is why we see some of this stuff occur. The downside of that is what you get is you get parents who are trying to stay up and take care of the kid themselves. And they're doing it 24 hours, staying up 48 hours. They're getting alarm fatigue, hitting silence. And as we all know, I mean, that's a recipe for disaster for us, much less a parent stuck in that situation, right? So. That's a, I guess that's more, that's another part of STARS. We can talk all day about all that stuff, so. Awesome, any other questions regarding tricks? All right, thank you guys. What's oh. that website again that has this information? So it's starsprogram.org. You guys d were working on access for you, but it's free to EMS. It's just, you know, we obviously just want you to be able to access the plans for the calls. So we're kind of going through the steps to get us there on that. Um, but uh, know that you guys do have a few kids. Um, and I think there, at least we have the form circulating possibly through your dispatch. I'm gonna meet with your dispatch today too. So we'll work on getting you guys the information on all your kiddos and um, 
please always feedback. I love to hear the good feedback, but I need to hear the bad as well. So if you have a STARS call that doesn't go well, please reach out to me and let me know. The only way we fix this program is by solving problem after problem after problem. So, Cool. Awesome. We'll be safe out there, guys. I